So here I am again, I'm going through the series I've been doing on, Mo on Moses in the book of Exodus. Uh, primarily this will be for the people in the chapel, but I do know that other people are looking in, which is good, and I uh, hope you can follow the, the way in which we've been going through this over the last few weeks. The title that I've got for the, this morning's message is, He is my rock. You often hear people referring to the fact that a particular person was a rock to them. Well, in a changing world, in a, in a world where nothing seems to be stable, nothing seems to be the same, well, we're going to see in the book of Exodus that there is one that we can rest in and one we can rest on, who is a rock to us. I'm going to read some words of Jesus Christ when he was on the Sermon on the Mount, or when he was on the Mount, giving his sermon. It's found in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 7, just a few verses, which are from verse 24 through to verse 28. Therefore, Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. Now, although we read from Matthew chapter chapter 7, we're actually looking in Exodus. And if you have your Bibles, you can follow in your own Bibles. We're going to be traveling from verse 29 of Exodus 24 through to verse one of chapter six. So we're, we're looking this morning at the one who is my rock. And following on in the series in Exodus, God has told Moses he was the man he was going to use to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. He was to be their savior. And so the book of Exodus is primarily about God. It's about God, again, showing that he is in con control, supreme control of everything. It's about a need for people to worship God as we look at these particular chapters. To fulfill his purposes to be worshipped, he was to have a people who would worship him. And he wanted them to worship him in a particular location. And at this moment in time, there was one standing between them and him, and it was Pharaoh who would not allow the people to go and to worship him. And last week, we spoke of Moses' situation and our own, and we said, for Moses, and certainly for ourselves, there may be troubles ahead. Now, the government has put out advice, and it's put out advice on, on social interaction, on, on hygiene. And the wise person is the person who will take notice of that advice, who will take notice of what has been said. They will do what has been told. And we will see that God's advice is the advice, God's advice is what we should take on in uncertain times. But despite taking on the desired um, actions that the government would have us to take, when we look at our news and we listen to what's being said and we see the graphs, we still see the difficulties ahead because things seem to be coming or, or being worse day by day as we, we monitor the situation. So is there's a need in our situation, in our day, to be wise, to listen, to obey advice. Now, not everybody's doing that. Obviously, we've heard today how people have been trying to get into Pembrokeshire in their second homes. Um, in the week, we heard of a footballer who decided to have a night's party with 20 fellows and went out of the party and, and bumped his car into other cars. And he was fined by his own club, Aston Villa. He was fined £150,000, which sounds extortionate. But to this man, it was only two weeks' wages, which perhaps makes us look at the situation in our day, what footballers are actually getting paid. But Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 following is saying, look, the wise person is the one who hears the words that I say, and he does them. And he likens him to a man who's going to build a house, and he's going to build a house upon a rock. And if the house is upon a rock, when the troubles come, when the wind and the rain comes down, well, it will withstand the troubles, it will withstand the rain, because it's founded upon this rock. 
and he's saying that he is that rock. And those who hear his words and those who trust in him will be able to face all the troubles this life can throw at us, but also that final storm, which will be death and that judgment to come. Then he says the foolish person is the person who takes no notice of what he's been saying. They take no thought of what's been put before them. They do not heed his word. And then when the storms come and the difficulties arrive, well, their house comes crashing down. So when all else is removed, what is our hope? What is our lives built upon? There's a, there's a hymn that says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, and all of the ground is sinking sand. So this morning, what is the foundation upon which our lives are built? The Christian message, the, the gospel, says we can trust in Jesus Christ in what he has done to bring us into fellowship with his Father in heaven, to be able to bring us to know him. That fellowship was broken. It was broken because of the entrance of sin into the world. And the Bible shows us between God, who is holy on one side, and ourselves who are sinful, there is this huge chasm that separates us, that makes it impossible for sinful people to actually approach a holy God. That sounds pretty depressing. But what we find in the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came into this world to bridge that chasm. He, he came into this world to make a way whereby we could cross over and have fellowship with God. And when he dies on the cross, what he's actually doing, as we will be considering at Easter time, I'm sure, he is dying there, not for his sin, but for the sins of the world, which has separated mankind from God. And for those who put their trust in him and those who turn from their sin to, to God for forgiveness through Jesus Christ, well, they find acceptance with God, his admission into his presence. And then those people can rest on his promises. So the wise person, the wise person at this moment in time is the person who listens to the commands of our health, our health officials and our government and takes note of what's being said and we, we follow the, the, the advice. The wise person, according to the gospel, is the person who listens to the words of Jesus Christ, trusts in him and rests upon his word and builds their lives upon him who is that promised rock. Now in Exodus, in chapter 4, and verse 29 to 31, Moses and his brother Aaron, they go forward now on the promises of God. They've been given the information from God that they were to, to have. The first people they had to meet were the leaders of their own people, the Hebrews. They wondered what the response would be. How would they respond to what was, what was being said? Well, they were amazed to see that they were, they were accepted. And they took note of what they said. And they were able to be convinced that God had a plan for his people. They rested in his promises. They trusted in him. In verse 31, we read, they joyfully believed when they heard these things and they knew these afflictions were coming to an end and they bowed down and they worshipped God. Oh, that today in the midst of all the troubles that we're going through, with all the afflictions that we know, oh, that we'd hear of people then turning to trust in God. This week, there was a, um, a businessman speaking alongside Donald Trump. And his, I think his brief was to talk about how he'd been able to modify equipment to cater for uh, the problems that they were knowing. He finished his little speech and then he turned to, to Mr. Trump and he asked, could he have permission to say a few more words? Mr. Trump gave him the, position, the, the permission. And then he began to say words like this. He said, in our society in America, we have removed God from our society. And now is the time that we turn again and we pray and we seek him. And he says, oh, that our nation would turn to him and pray to him. It'll be interesting tomorrow. Our queen is going to give a speech tomorrow evening. It'll be interesting if our queen calls our country to prayer. Someone sent me um, a clip this week and it was about the, the prime minister of Jamaica back in 2017 with some of the troubles that they'd known. And he gave a talk, lasted about 10 minutes. Most of that talk was about prayer, talking to his country, and he led them in prayer for probably about five or six minutes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we found that from our leaders today too? 
turn our country to prayer in the midst of our troubles. We have found during the mad rush of life and the activity around us that we've suddenly had to grind to a halt. Probably for the first time in many of our lives, we've been able to stop and take time out. And maybe it could be a time when we could reflect upon what our lives are actually built upon. Is it a life which, like Moses, is built upon the promises of God? Like Jesus Christ said, we can, we can build our, our lives upon him. Because if we build it upon anything else, it is uncertain as we're finding out now. And it's just sand. And what good is it to have so many precious things that we may have and we may want to use? And we cannot use them. We cannot um, use them for our own disposal at this time. It wasn't long ago we were listening to the budget and we were thinking, what a, what a positive budget. Money was going to be thrown at infrastructure and at various situations in our land. And now suddenly we find with the, the epidemic that's taking place, I'm pretty sure a lot of that money will be moved at the end of what we're going through now. For Israel, God sent a saviour that moved them to worship. In the New Testament, God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, with his promises to bring hope, not just for time, but for eternity. That life he would show is more important than just these 70 years or so that we're going to be spared on this planet. A promise of deliverance for these Hebrews was for those who put their faith in God upon him as their rock. Moses was to convince them that God's promises were true. He is not caught out. He's not found short in his delivery. Pharaoh will be seen as the foolish man who seemed to have everything, but actually had his, built, his, his life built upon nothing. Because the Bible tells me the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So Moses and Aaron in chapter 5 and verses 1 to 14, they, 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 they go to Pharaoh. And they must have felt that things were doing well. They'd gone to their own people. They'd had a good response. They were over the first hurdle. And they seemed to have accepted their message. Now they go to Pharaoh. Moses follows God's command. but. The result was not looking good, as we will see. We watch the graphs presented on our news of the virus, and we see that most of the people are obeying their rules. Most of the people are keeping social distancing. It. I've never seen so many people walk around our village. And then when you come close to them, they step aside, don't they, for about a two meter space. But it's amazing with no cars driving around, how you're able now to speak to people in our village rather than see everyone driving in and out. Yet as we look at the graphs, there doesn't seem to be any great improvement on the horizon. So we could lose heart. Moses in chapter five and, and Aaron, they've been buoyed by the response of their people. And now they're in the palace of the greatest leader in the world at that time. The message was from God. The message was this. Let my people go. Yet he gets a disappointing response. He will not let them go. Now, not only would he refuse to let them go, he was actually going to make things far more worse for their people. To Moses, it could have seemed strange. He's been obedient to God. Instead of things getting better, they seem to be getting worse. Strange how obedience could produce trials and more hardships. Two things. First, we see that, that Moses is going to speak to the world, to Pharaoh, about God. And secondly, Moses is going to speak to God about the world or about Pharaoh. He speaks to the world about God in chapter 5 and verse 2. Pharaoh's response is, who is the Lord that I should obey? And what authority does he have over me? That sounds very familiar. The people's response to the things of God today. Moses was preaching God's precious word. He was speaking the word. He was telling Pharaoh this is God's word. And that was his role. Verses 20 and 23 to 23 tells us that. Now the church's role is to preach and to pray. 
Moses and Aaron don't come and wonder how the message can be presented so that it may be more acceptable or it may be um, more effective if we take a particular approach. They just come with, with the word of God. They say, thus says the Lord. Please let our people go three days into the wilderness because if you don't, there will be consequences for you and for your land. Verses 4 to 21, Pharaoh, like any other dictator, was having none of it. The thought of him having to stop his building projects to remove his labour force, he was having none of it. Yet he had not brought into consideration there was a greater power behind all this than just Pharaoh. Verses 4 and 5, rather than allow them to break and go into the, into the wilderness for three days to worship, he was determined to make things harder for them in verses 8 to 9. In actual fact, he up, up the, the requirement of output for the working force. And he made it harder for them instead of providing them with straw from his land and from his people to make the bricks. He tells the, the Hebrews they must go and find their own straw and go looking for it themselves. But he wants the, the, the work ratio up. He looks at them and he thinks they're nothing but a lazy group of people. If they fail to, fail to meet the quota in verse 14, he says, your foremen are going to be beaten. So Pharaoh was about work, work, work. No rest. I think I said last week that God in his wisdom has given us one day in seven to rest, to set aside, to worship him. It's for the good of not only his church, I believe it's for the good of society. It's for our well-being. In the midst of a crazy world where we rush and tear everywhere, we need that time to stop and to rest and to reflect. To reflect on what have we built our lives upon. Scripture says we need to be still and know there's God, that I am God. Who is the Lord that I should hear his voice? When people hear about God's claims, about Jesus Christ's desire for us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we hear the response, who is God that I should take any note of, notice of him? People live their lives and they want to live their lives without any restriction, restraints that God could put on them. To be faithful, as God had made Moses and Aaron, it, it wasn't going to be easy. In fact, they were going to become the butt of all the abuse now from their own people when things got harder for them. They would say, look, look what's happening. Since you've arrived on the scene, things have got worse for us as a people. Things do not always work out the way we would like them to work out. But Moses and Aaron, at least they've been obedient. And they spoke to the world about God. And the church is to speak to the world. We're to tell people of the great hope found as the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. So he spoke to the world about God and now he speaks to God about the world. Now where can he go? Things seem to be going from bad to worse. But he has this rock, doesn't he? Who, Despite the circumstances in life, despite the changes, we have a God who changes not. The Christian says, where can I go but to the Lord? The person who has known what it is to enter into fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, they have access to God. We have opened to us this great avenue of prayer. We can have an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Moses turns to God in prayer. And we too can turn to him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our griefs and sins to bear. What a privilege, says the hymn writer, to carry everything to God in prayer. He seems to be saying in verse 22, is this why you sent me, Lord? Why is all this happening? He speaks about the happenings in this world. Was this was what was to happen? The people will know more hardships. For a moment he'd forgotten what God had said and God had said to him he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Why, how long was Moses' sort of response in prayer to God? How long is this to go on? And Moses could have lost heart. He could have gone to pieces. He presented God's word. and He got a negative response from Pharaoh. Now as Christians, as churches over the last decades, we've preached and we've presented the word of God 
the hope found in Jesus Christ to the world. And yet, by and large, it's been rejected. The younger generation seem to have little interest. The old generation, they always seem to talk in the past tense and they tell you, well, I was church and I was chapel in the past tense. But what can the churches do? Well, we can present God's truth and we can pray. In chapter 6 and verse 1, as we come towards the end, the Lord turns around and says that you will see now what I will do, because I am God. The power was not with Pharaoh, it was with God. God was to display his glory against a background of complete darkness. See what he will do, because salvation belongs to the Lord. So we can lose heart, we can lose perspective. We can think God is not in control. The disciples thought on that Good Friday, God was not in control. They'd lost their master. He had been crucified. That was why he came. He came to fulfill God's purpose. To die, not just to die for our sins, but to rise again and to conquer death and sin. This was God's plan. From the darkness of Calvary would come light. There would be eternal hope. Forgiveness of sins, he would bring glory out of suffering, and who knows what God may be able to do in these days. So we pray we will look and see what our lives are founded upon. Is it just something which is superficial, which is just like sand? Well, there is a rock upon which we can depend. He is the judge of all the earth who does all things right. For the person who believes and trusts in his promises found in Jesus Christ through life. He is their rock and underneath them is his everlasting arms. He allowed Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel to know hardships so that they could see his glory. And may we through these weeks and through these days see that there's one we can trust in, there is one that we can find hope in. As we, we come towards the end, and I want to pray, just give a short prayer. I came across something else this week, someone had, had, had sent. It says, staying informed and making wise decisions based on the information is a good thing. The problem we can develop an unhealthy ha habit in our hearts where we meditate on trouble and we forget God. When we do this, the crisis will loom larger and larger. God will appear smaller and smaller. The most powerful weapon we have is prayer. And the most powerful weapon against fear is prayer and, and gratitude. When we intentionally look for reasons to be thankful, we do not deny the reality of the situation. We're not disregarding the grim statistics or ignoring the counsel of our government officials. But we look at reality through the lens of the things for which we should be thankful. Here's some of the things that were noted. The first place to look is vertically. Give thanks to God for who he is. Thank him for his patience, his love and his mercy and grace. And you looked with gratitude vertically. Search for all the reasons you have to be thankful horizontally, specifically in people and places and things. Thank God for the people he has placed in your life. Even during the moment of social distancing, you are surrounded by people who know you, who love you, who text, call or FaceTime you and will walk with you. Thank God for the places in your life. Maybe that local park where you can walk, perhaps that's a neighbourhood store that as food for your daily necessity. Give thanks for your home where you can be safe and for the specific rooms where you can eat, relax, exercise and sleep. Thank God for the things in your life. Have you taken for granted the technology that allows us to be connected through the internet? I've actually learned what Zoom means because tomorrow my children will be on Zoom and we'll all be talking in my lounge. But thankfully we can look to that rock when David was facing trouble, in Psalms 27, he says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and inquire in his temple. Like David, 
You will only understand this crisis or any troubling situation accurately and respond to it biblically if we look to our Lord, his character, his grace, and the people, places and things that he's provided for us. And we build our lives upon that rock, the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. I'm going to pray. We're going to give thanks to God for those benefits that we have. We can pray for our loved ones, those that we're separated from, and we can pray for those who are on their own. We have a number of people in our chapel who live on their own, and so they're isolated from being able to have dealings with people. And we can pray for our leaders, for our Queen and our Prime Minister. Let us pray. So, Father in heaven, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We have one that we can rest in and on. We thank you for that rock, your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, upon whom we can depend and we can rest and we can know acceptance with you through him. We thank you that in this life we can find all that we need, him to be our rock and our strength. We thank you for those things that we've mentioned, that you've given to us, our homes, our communities. We thank you for the things that now enable us to be able to connect with those who are far off. For all the blessings, the food that we receive, the warmth, the, the houses. But most of all, we thank you for your love, your mercy and your grace. We pray for our government. We pray for them at this time. And we ask, Heavenly Father, you will give them much wisdom in these particular days to guide us in the ways which will be right. We pray again for those who are lonely. Pray for those from our own chapel who are on their own, that you will be with them. And we just thank you for all your blessings. We pray you will go with us. You will bless us and keep us at this time. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God willing, I'll have another sermon tonight from, from Matthew's Gospel. If you want to listen, if not, next Sunday. <laughs>